the assumption of the city hall suggesting that this is the pe people's choice to work and live there is totally false and it's actually an ideological weapon to justify this social marginalization. We're here in Cluj-Napoca, Romania, filming outside Transit House, which is a cultural center that used to be a synagogue. We're going to talk about the concept of environmental racism and how it uh, is affecting this region. Environmental racism is maybe a new term for something which has existed for centuries. Uh, in basic terms, it's the way in which certain groups of people uh, can be exposed to greater environmental risk uh, unclean water, unclean air, unsafe living conditions uh, because uh, of racist attitudes in society or maybe uh, discrimination against other kinds of groups such as poor people. We're going to be talking about some of the examples uh, from the region of this and how to combat uh, this phenomenon. Uh, with me to discuss this, going around this little table, uh, Anita Lushi, who is an activist at the political organization in Albania. Jana Soneva, a PhD student in sociology, living between Bulgaria and Hungary. Eniko Vince, an anthropologist and a housing activist uh, living here in Cluj. And uh, Claudio Kraciun, who's a political activist uh, also from here in Romania. Now, Eniko, I want to start with you, if I can, because there's an example uh, of what could be called environmental racism, not very far away from where we're sitting uh, here in Cluj. It's the uh, Patarat area. Maybe you could explain a little bit what it is, why it's an example of environmental racism, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, as you said, it's an example of environmental racism, among other things, because I guess uh, the phenomenon of Patarut uh, is a mirror for uh, all the, the marginalization and exclusion processes that uh, happened in Romania and not only, I guess, in the past 25 years. So there are different uh, processes that, that create this situation of marginalization, economic and political processes. Um, and racism always comes to, to justify why does this happen and unfortunately in the eye of the majority this is um, so-called good justification for why this should happen to particular categories of people who are inferiorized and racialized at the same time. Maybe um, for, for people who don't know, just explain a little bit what the situation is in Patarat in terms of who's living there. Okay, so the um, uh, area was formed um, as a result of a long process started at the end of the 1960s, last century. So it's a very long history. Uh, first, uh, people were uh, settled there um, while looking for resources of income nearby the landfill. So this started during the socialist regime, but grew and, and, and changed a lot after 1990. Why? Because these processes of, of gentrification and, and uh, capitalist developments uh, pushed uh, several people uh, to the margins of the city. So that's how uh, the Cantonului area was formed uh, by people who were evicted during their lifetime for several times. Then we have the case of the modular houses, which is a new creation uh, and it's the, it, it reflects uh, um, in a very crystallized form uh, the effect of neoliberal development policies uh, locally. So those modular houses were constructed by the municipality in 2010 with the particular aim to relocate their so-called homeless people from, from Castle Street, from a more uh, central area of the city. But very importantly is to add that those people were not homeless people because they were um, renters of, of former social housing. Um, they were kicked out from those, those buildings were demolished in an area which went through a gentrification ever since. 
So the assumption of the city hall suggesting that this is the pe people's choice to work and live there is totally false and it's actually an ideological weapon to justify this social marginalization and, and to pretend that these people are social parasites, they, uh, the society doesn't need them, so they are redundant, they are useless. However, when we look what they do and what they work, we can uh, learn uh, how their labor force is used and exploited. First of all, or among others in the waste industry, starting with the unpaid, unprotected labor on the landfill, but the other parts also of, of the waste industry, sanitation companies and, and recycling uh, uh, companies including. I mean, you've explained how multiple forms of discrimination, exploitation, uh, focus themselves in, on unfortunately a particular group in a particular area. Uh, close to here. I want to come to Anita to ask if there are similar examples in, in Albania um, of this kind of mix of discrimination, environmental degradation, um, perhaps focusing on a particular group. So we have the same situation in Albania, in Tirana, or worse actually. There is a larger landfill than in Patarat where people work unprotected without uh, security measures, even children work there and um, their houses, if we can call them houses, they are horrible. They live in a horrible, horrible conditions. They have no utilities. Uh, they are, uh, we can say that uh, they live in open space. It can call an open space. And um, the, not only their work conditions, so as I said, all, uh, also, the living conditions are horrible, but uh, the horrible thing is that less than two months ago, a boy died there, working in the landfill. It was a 17 years old, 16, 17 years old boy who was working there to get money to buy his clothes for, for school. And, um, but the mind-blowing fact is that uh, the major of the municipality of Tirana sometimes, uh, recently, sometimes ago, before the boy de was dead, he was um, saying that that landfill was a success. People who worked there was, uh, were working in uh, good conditions and after the boy died, no one said a word about that. So, also, the other thing is that uh, the municipality, recently, uh, what they did was to put the cans, the trash cans, in the road under, uh, their, under their ownership. So, people, mostly Roma people who work collecting, uh, live collecting uh, garbages from the cans, they couldn't do that anymore because it was considered a crime. So they could not live through that. That's an economical dis discrimination, what happens there. And, um, but it's not going on only in Tirana, but in other cities too. So Elbasan, uh, other cities in Albania. And the most, uh, the, um, the most uh, people who work there, there is Roma people. They are Roma people. So it's a discrimination what is happening to them, but no one does nothing to help them or to provide them um, jobs or uh, to provide them houses or proper houses and to provide their education. So children are forced to work there, are forced because they have no other solutions. They have to bring food in the table. So they have to work and not to go to school. This is the situation in Okay, we're going to come to, to how we think we should address these kinds of situations, but maybe just sticking on trying to understand the phenomena. Um, Jana, I can ask you about examples from Bulgaria, but perhaps more generally about the ways that you think that racism uh, is embedded in uh, various parts of the economic and political system, if you, if you share that hypothesis. Yeah, I, I completely share it and I think we should keep a very tight focus on the economic roots of racism. And I can even give you an example, we don't have to keep it on the level of generalities. 
For example, in Bulgaria in 1992, as part of the liberal reforms, the land which was nationalized by the communists was given back to the so-called original owners. This, this means the owners before 1944 and the uh, period when the land nationalization started and collectivization. So suddenly you have people who for three or four generations they never worked land, but suddenly they wake up owners of big swaths of agricultural land and the people who had been hitherto working on it, which were ex predominantly Roma people, they were suddenly out of this. So this is how the original act of what in the liberal imagination constituted, you know, uh, justice, you know, let's give back the land to the original owner, is, it, it's tainted by, if you want, an original racist sin, you know. This is how this population of, surplus population from the point of view of capital was created. So we suddenly had a lot of people who had no access to land, no jobs, no nothing. You know, this is not, we should not speak about the Roma people as a culture, even if there are certain identifiable cultural forms associated with their lifestyles and so on. But we should primarily look at these processes of economic marginalizations, which were the necessary effect of capitalist restoration in the 90s. You know, and I can give you countless examples of this. Claudio, I, I, I want to come to an example of a, of a successful series of political actions uh, here in Romania, famous now actually throughout Europe, which is the, the campaign to uh, save Rosia Montana from gold mining with cyanide, which obviously has uh, some environmental consequences. And it seems like that campaign has been successful uh, in stopping the, the mining, um, at least for the moment. Uh, maybe you can, you can, since you were partly involved in that, draw some lessons from the reasons for the success of that campaign and perhaps see if there's, there's anything we can learn for these broader questions of racism, exploitation, uh, connected with environmental factors. Well, it was a successful political campaign because of the results, not, not necessarily because of the composition of the group who was, was actively opposing uh, the gold mining project. Actually, it was a, a, a myriad of actors, agents, organizations uh, starting from the local, very local community, then the, uh, the activists and the academic uh, circles in Cluj, then people in Bucharest, and of course also international activists. So uh, it was a, um, a combination of, of, of factors for the success. I think the Rosia Montana came in a, in a very specific uh, moment in Romania. Uh, after years and years of economic transition, which was very painful for most of the inhabitants, uh, transition which came with two supporting ideas. First, we have to sacrifice everything in order to develop economically. Uh, develop, I put in brackets, uh, because m many of the, the projects that they were proposed, they were, not, they were not developing the country, but, you know, uh, kind of represented a, some sort of capture from p private interests. Uh, failed privatizations, which ended in just selling the land, not creating viable economic uh, organizations. So we were used to say, let's sacrifice everything in order to create some jobs and economic develop, uh, develop uh, economically, uh, sacrifice local communities, uh, fundamental rights, in nature, everything. So, uh, at, and this Russia Montana case came into, into a moment when people realized that we should stop sacrificing in order to get some minor, minor uh, economic advantages, which in this case come with a very high environmental cost. We're talking about the largest gold mine in Europe. We're talking about putting down four mountains, which are actually full of Roman time galleries, so they are also heritage uh, sites, uh, basically destroying it. So uh, there was this particular moment, there was a click when people say, well, we should think of other things. We should, we should think about that community. We should think about the economic impact on the wider region because around Rosia Montana, there are networks of producers and merchants which are giving you know, jobs, stable jobs to, 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 to the larger community. So 
it, it was a very relevant story for uh, most of us. And in the second, in the, uh, a second element, which was very important, because the company was so powerful and gave up that much money to all political parties and mainstream media outlets, it became very uh, visible, this kind of corrupt and wicked link between economic interests, political elites and mass media. And people immediately felt that it's something not honest, something not honest there. And people reacted. I mean, we're not talking about the local communities. We're talking about trade unions. We're talking about churches. We're talking about independent mass media. It was a, it was a moment of separation between worlds. The world of politicians, which were defending the rights or the interests of uh, corporations. And then the other people who realized that we should stop sacrificing citizens or, or, or communities in order to actually enrich some people. Yes, thank you. Enrico, we just heard that Rosio Montana was perhaps a successful popular campaign because it made certain things clear. Uh, it made it obvious that there was, uh, on the one side, capitalist exploitation of people and resources, and on the other side, um, attempts to preserve some things of, uh, of value. Do you see some potential um, in, in, in trying to campaign on the situation in Patarut and address broader questions of, of structural racism in, in trying to make things clear in that way? And how could we go about doing it? Um, how could we really bring out the ways in which multiple problems which don't just affect mm -hmm. people living at Patarut or the Roma communities are actually focused on them and so it's a broader social issue? Yes, yes indeed. And if we agree that um um, this is a class issue and it reflects class inequalities and this is all part of, of how capitalism functions, then um, obviously we can address or might address the, the systemic roots of such situations in a more radical ways. But till then, uh, or in parallel with that, um, what we try locally as activists uh, is to, uh, to uh, raise the accountability of the state and of the local government in terms of uh, um, using local resources, uh, public resources, uh, in order to, uh, to assure the housing rights, for example, of the most marginalized. Because what's happening with, with states and the governance is that uh, in the past at least uh, 15 years, it's very clearly put um, under the interests of the market. So we see how the state became a, 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 a a builder, a, a builder of the of the market, including the housing market, and what we do is to reclaim back the the social and economic rights, including housing rights. On the other hand, we have uh, the workers on the of the landfill, where there is a strong need to make them recognize as workers and as um, um, actors who are entitled to to labor rights. Um, so these I see as, as two points, so not necessarily, um, I don't know, I mean it's, it's very useful to address racism as a cultural system, but indeed to address these economic roots and, and to also uh, highlight how racism justifies them, but not staying with, uh, I don't know, trying to change the mindset of, 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 of people and their cultural beliefs, but to, to address institutional, uh, structural uh, factors that create uh, labor exploitation and create housing deprivation. I would add that here uh, is of crucial importance to attack austerity, because this is the uh, chief government policy right now. And it uh, is very obvious how racism and austerity go hand in hand. Somehow it's a, it's a perverse dialectic in which you have this very cold economic calculus, like how to um, uh, cut money from the budgets and how to cut spending and all of that, going hand in hand with hot racist cliches. So what usually happens in Bulgaria is that every time the government wants to pass um, a certain uh, austerity politics, let's say they cut budgets for schools or whatever, they 
justify that in racist terms. They say we need to limit the access of the so-called social parasites to uh, public assistance programs because they're wasting too much, they're not giving to society back, all of this. You know, so every time they, they want to cut, they, they mobilize racism. And it is obvious that we need to, to, to address first the economic issues and then yeah, go, go into the... Yeah, we're somehow parallel, hand in hand. I mean, to deconstruct how ideologies naturalize, justify the economic inequalities. Yeah, because no one in their right mind is going to vote for a program which says that, yeah, we're going to uh, leave you without any health care or without any education, right? So this is clearly a very, not only a legitimation strategy, but also a technology of governance. Anitra, I want to bring you in um, with maybe some examples of strategies in, in, in Albania, but also perhaps to bring out there's a, there's a geopolitical element to this uh, economic underpinning of racism, perhaps. And if we think about you know, waste management and some of the agreements between Italy and Albania recently, it, it becomes clear that one can't just talk about local economic factors. Maybe you can, you can give some insight into how that's perceived from Albania and maybe if there's any strategies of yes, trying to fight actually, against it. Right now we're facing another problem, uh, which is uh, we are impor importing wastes to recycle waste from other countries. And uh, we recycle only 25% of our own waste due to bad management. And now our, we are importing waste from Italy and it was uh, the same uh, draft before in 2013 that uh, the government, the actual go government, uh, the Socialist Party, they came to power and the first decision they made is to not pass this law. So it was a draft then, so they didn't pass that law. It was on, uh, not only about importing waste, about, uh, also about uh, the demolition of uh, chemical we weapons in Albania. Syrian weapons, uh, they are in Ita Italia, uh, so to demolate that in Albania, but they didn't pass. But right now, like uh, a week ago, they just passed the law. They passed the law, so <laughs> due to interests of uh, companies who they protect, the interests of bigger companies. And uh, right now we are trying to mobilize, to raise awareness of what is happening what is happening in Albania. So people in 2013, they, 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 they hit the road. They hit the road and uh, that's why this, uh, this, uh, that was stopped. And right now we are trying to do the same thing, to collaborate with other actors uh, of uh, civic society and uh, other organizations, with uh, students, with uh, trade unions. So, to do this and to stop, uh, to to return this law, so and to do to to improvise uh, to, to to improvise the, the recycling in Albania right now. So we don't need we don't have the capacities to recycle waste of other countries. We don't have we do not have the capacities to recycle our own waste. So. Let's let's work on this. After that, we can maybe we can import waste of other countries. But right now, we need to focus on our own waste. Yeah, I guess this is a good example how this whole local national developments are part of of of, of, of the global uh, market and how particular countries that are inferiorized in terms of you know. Uh, belonging to particular geopolitical areas or others uh, are getting their roles in sustaining global capital and becoming the, the wasteland of, of Europe and of a more developed country. Absolutely, it shows that environmental racism can be very local and targeted to specific groups. One of the countries. problem is not just the, the source of, of, of this kind of transfer between periphery and semi-periphery countries. Uh, uh, it's also about how you formulate a resistance to it. Mm -hmm. And it happens, it happens in Romania when we're talking about, for example, deforestation. There are large, largely some foreign companies which are not doing the same with the, the forest in their home countries mm -hmm. or with uh, specific technologies uh, which are used in Romania. 
uh, well, the response to it, the opposition, the resistance, uh, it, sh it shouldn't be in, in terms of, of nationalism. I mean, I don't think it's a problem that mm -hmm. those companies are foreign. The problem is what they do. I mean, there, there mm -hmm. might be foreign companies which are building, which are helping, you know, the, 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 the specific countries. But some of them, they don't. Mm -hmm. So we have to make a differentiation between uh, uh, foreign companies which are coming into this, uh, th these countries because a, a wrong answer would mean nationalism. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a, the, the, the right answer is nationalism to say whatever is foreign, mm -hmm. it's bad. No, maybe use a simple principle. Whoever wants to build mm -hmm. is welcome. And it could, could be Romanian, Albanian or Italian, Austrian, Canadian. It's about how, what criteria you use in judging this kind of, 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 of uh, projects. But do you think there are any companies, foreign or local, who uh, invest in order to help or to build or like help develop? No, they do for profit. They do it for profit. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the problem is the capacity and the willing of the national authorities to implement existing laws in some cases, because in our cases we do have European legislation on environment and other, other areas, sometimes they do, don't do it. They but don't the do problem it. in Albania is legal, you know. They pass the law which enables the importation of garbage I, I, into Albania. This the, is perfectly the multinational legal. companies. Some, yes. interest some, sometimes it is legal. It's, it's, it's okay to just implement legislation. Sometimes you have to change the legislation. And most of the times you have to play the power game and sort of make this decision makers, prime ministers, ministers, uh, party leaders, pay for their bad decisions which are bad decisions mainly for the marginal people and it's not for them they live in like nice houses and they you know in mm -hmm. special apartment blocks they, they don't really care they don't feel they don't feel the, the effects of their decisions so as long as we think about that and we are trying to pressure both let's say the public and the, the elite the, the elite to kind of resist this 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 uh, this, uh, this pressure there is a pressure i think we could stop some of the projects. Not all, of course, but we could stop some of the projects. I think that it, it, it's become clear from this little exchange that um, politics has a role and, 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 and politicians have a role, that businesses just on their own are not going to decide to invest in sustainable or socially just ways. That uh, That's one of the reasons there is legislation. Where there's bad legislation, it should be opposed. Where there are bad projects, there sh they should be opposed. Uh, but it leaves the gaping question of how does one act in such a way as to create good legislation and good politics in the countries. And so that's the question I wanted to close with is, is, is civic action enough? Um, does it require actually uh, entering into, into political institutions to change these? And if, if it does require entering into political institutions, how to avoid being caught up in the same political economy of structural racism uh, that one's trying to combat? Anyone want to have a go? It's a, it's a tough question. Well, it's the last question. <laughs> <It's>, and I <laughs> well, I mean, we, we always talk, what, what, what's the best option? To stay in civil society, organize campaigns, to do petitions, protests, or rather uh, organizing uh, on more kind of institutionalized, formal way, even entering elections as independents or parties. Uh, well, I think there, there are trade-offs and benefits and advantages for each each of the, the options, uh, as long as in, in every situation you are, you stick to the values, you stick to the principles, you stick to the, uh, the projects. So you can be civil society, you can be parties. I'm very uh, hesitant to say old parties because they are usually oligarchic parties, cartel parties, which are very linked to eco high economic interests. So I don't think it's really possible to reform all parties in the transition maybe new projects, maybe. So as long as we stick to these policies and values, civil society, political parties, they can, they can go well. I'm kind of maybe disillusioned and even a little bit tired of this civil society talk. It's been 20 something years, civil society, civil society. I think we need something new. We need to work on, on a much deeper institutional level, you know. So parties.
Because civil society can only do so much, you know, this is by definition a reactive mobilization, you know, something happens, people gather, they start complaining, they, okay, they exercise pressure, that's all very good, but then it is still up to the policymaker and the people in power to change whatever they've been doing, you know, so for me, maybe a better way would be to start thinking like how to stop complaining or try to fill up the gaps of the retreat of the welfare state by, you know, oh, let's mobilize, let's, we can do it ourselves, and this kind of stuff, and how to, to, to start having much more direct impact on the state. Because, yes, I, I, I find your slogan sympathetic, you know, democracy beyond the nation state, but somehow we're still stuck in nation states or states or capitalist states, even worse than nation states, you know, so we need to, to really go to that level. Absolutely. I think going beyond can be understood in several different Going beyond, senses. yeah, but it go, you go beyond in and through the institutions of the state. You cannot simply retract and say, I will just do my commune uh, in the hippie forest or I will just do uh, NGO work or something like this, you know. You need much more kind of close engagement if you want to, to, to get your ideas put into practice. Absolutely. I think uh, there's also the risk that the hippie forest uh, might become uh, polluted or deforested, <laughs> uh, given the way things are going. So we've had quite a, uh, a discussion of environmental racism um, in the region. I think, unfortunately, it's a term that's going to be heard more and more uh, and a phenomenon that we're going to be facing more and more. So we better come up with some strategies for how to deal with it. Uh, we heard some uh, strategies from here and no doubt in future episodes of Talk Real, we'll hear about more. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.